Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us for today's webinar, Fabrication Design and Constructability for Mass Timber Structures. My name is Felix, and I'm the webinar coordinator at the Continuing Education Department here at the OEA. We will begin today's webinar by acknowledging the land on which we are meeting and calling in from today. For millennia, the place we call Ontario has been inhabited by indigenous peoples and nations who have been stewards of the land and are deeply connected to its rich cultural and natural landscape. We would like to invite you in a moment of reflection to acknowledge our shared responsibility to address past and present injustices and provide space for indigenous knowledge and worldviews to shape the architectural landscape of Turtle Island. Before we commence, I would like to share some important information to ensure an, infect an effective and professional webinar experience. Please be informed that this session is being recorded for quality and educational purposes. In order to maintain a stable internet connection, we have muted all participant microphones and disabled video feeds. We highly encourage engagement through our Q&A window. Feel free to submit any questions you may have for our speakers. These will be addressed in the designated question and answer period at the end of the presentation. Kindly note, the chat function will be deactivated following this introduction, except when needed for responding to questions during the webinar. For those seeking continuing education learning hours, please note that attendance is crucial. A minimum of 80% is required for these hours to be accredited to your transcript. Please allow up to a few weeks for the processing and reporting of these hours. And lastly, Please note that the presenters do not provide insurance, legal, or practice advice, and the OAA does not bear responsibility for errors or omissions in discussions during the webinar. For accessibility, we provide automated closed captioning service available in multiple languages to accom accommodate the needs of our diverse audience. Now, I'm excited to introduce our speakers for today's sessions. Please welcome Mike Engel, Thomas Brocci, and Jamie Connolly. Thanks for your attention. Let us now proceed with the session and I'm passing it over to our speakers. Thank you very much, Felix. And thank you all for attending this webinar on fabrication design and constructability for mass timber structures. Uh, just a bit about us. We are all uh, employees of Aspect Structural Engineers, and we're kind of representing kind of all three of our offices. So we've got Mike uh, Engel out of our Vancouver office, uh, myself, Jamie Connolly, an associate in our Toronto office, and Thomas Brochi, an associate in our Bern, Switzerland office. Um, our, you know, decision to open an office in Bern was kind of help us connect with the with the epicenter of mass timber knowledge in Switzerland and kind of tap into that and feed it into our projects in North America. There also might be a special guest appearance from my dog Murphy. So apologies in advance if he starts crying or barking when he's jealous that I'm talking on a screen. Um, our services, you know, we're a kind of full service structural engineering firm. Uh, you know, we do traditional structural engineering, design assist, feasibility, studies, et cetera, but we also are getting involved in production and manufacturing uh, in our specialty engineering and fabrication design division, uh, as well as logistics and installation for mass timber projects. <clears throat> our specialties include mass timber, tall mass timber buildings, kind of fabrication and procurement strategies, um, prefabrication and offsite construction, as well as research and development. Our project types kind of run the gamut, you know, anything from public art to custom homes, restaurants, schools, office buildings, you name it, we, we do it. <clears throat> so getting to the, the learning objectives of this webinar, first, we're going to talk about the design approach and explore the complexity of front end planning for mass timber projects and the roles and interplay between designers, fabricators, and builders. Uh, then we'll go into fabrication design and the importance of fabrication modeling to ensure an efficient installation on site. We'll then talk about the construction challenges and solutions by reviewing some complex and unforeseen construction challenges that were solved through close collaboration 
between designers and builders to meet the site schedule, budget, and safety requirements. And then we'll talk about, you know, designing for this fabrication and installation and kind of how to avoid these issues and examine the pivotal role that uh, installation and fabrication plays in arriving at appropriate design solutions. So we're going to use this graph a lot to talk about and we're going to refer back to it a few times uh, because we think it's really important. So on the x-axis, you can kind of see the typical phases of a project. And then you could see kind of two things plotted against each other, which is the opportunity to influence and change design, as well as the cost of change. And these are kind of diverging as you get farther along in the process. So we'll talk about kind of you know, how you go from concept to design development and detailing. Here, we're gonna talk about kind of the design process, um, mapping the life cycle and timelines, touch on the materials and products and why it's important to understand what's available. Talk about massing and layout principles, uh, touch briefly on lateral systems, uh, code considerations and other design considerations uh, that are important for the success of a mass timber project. So again, back to this graph. Um, essentially, you know, the, the opportunity to influence design decreases while the cost increases. So it is truly paramount to pull as much of the design forward as you possibly can uh, in order to, you know, see the schedule and cost benefits of a mass timber project. And kind of this figure can be at odds with kind of the traditional delivery model for a project where project knowledge and information increases over time. So you really need to find a way to increase project knowledge in the design and tender phases and less in the kind of execution and operation phases. And, you know, one of the ways to do this is to develop 3D BIM models, uh, as opposed to 2D drawings and, and other things that we'll talk about. So this is what we call the design bid build fallacy. So, you know, typically a project is structured in this way where you'll have a design phase, you'll produce your documentation, you'll tender it, and then you build it. But what's actually happening there is you have a long design phase, you tender it, you get bids, you get a bunch of specialty engineering and redesign or value engineering, and then you build it. Um, and you typically end up with something that you didn't necessarily want. So, you know, we kind of break down this project life cycle into kind of three main buckets, the design, which is, you know, basis of design, the permit drawings, you know, all the traditional design deliverables but then into product and manufacturing, and then into logistics, erection and installation. So with each of these handoffs in scope, there's typically an increased cost that is sometimes buried in you know, your contractor's costs and you don't always see it, but there's also very importantly, a loss of fidelity in the design and you're kind of losing control over the process uh, as it starts touching more hands so, you know, what some of the things we're trying to do by getting involved in these downstream scopes is to just give more control over the design and kind of eliminate some of this extra cost. <clears throat> so one of the ways you could do this well is kind of with a design assist approach. So basically bring in as many of the design professionals as you can early in the design phase to help influence your design. And this lets you kind of stack the fabrication design, the manufacturing, the bidding, and then building. And, you know, generally you have a shorter timeline. And, and you really just need to rethink the standard timeline. You, you need to bring in the trades or experienced consultants into the design phases as much as you can. Um, and there's two figures here. And the bottom one is kind of for a, a prefab project that we've done. And if you're trying to do prefabbed or pre-manufactured systems, it is absolutely crucial to, to bring in all the consultants as early as possible. So now we'll talk a bit about the materials and products available for mass timber construction. 
Um, you know, it's still a novel construction type, although it's becoming more and more popular. Um, you can see on this figure on the left, mass timber construction in 2020 in the U.S. accounted for less than 1% of the overall construction market. Um, so it's a, still a novel material compared to concrete steel or even lightwood frame. And due to this immaturity, there's kind of less formalized standardization between the products and widely accepted best practices. So you really need to understand what products are available and what are the differences between them. It's also important to understand how different manufacturer capabilities uh, or even just preferences may influence your design and how choosing these systems um, like affects other trades. So this is just a neat tool that I thought I would plug in here. It's from NRCAN. It kind of maps all the different mass timber projects around Canada, as well as all the different manufacturers. So again, a super useful tool for seeing what kind of precedents are out there and you can filter by, you know, ownership type, stories, area, construction gear, province, everything. So it's just a, a good resource for figuring out what is out there. So now we'll get into the details of the products. Essentially, you can break this down into linear products. I call them sticks. Uh, panel products, timber concrete composites, and specialty products. For solid wood linear products, you have dimensional lumber, which everyone is familiar with, sawn timber, which is kind of, you know, larger cross-section solid wood members, as well as glue laminated timber or glue lamb, which is made from gluing up smaller sticks. In Canada, we've got a few glue lamp suppliers, uh, Nordic, Element 5, Goodfellow, Western Artrib, Kolesnikov, and Mercer. And again, all of these have their own idiosyncrasies in terms of what they produce and how they like to produce it. So having a relationship with them is really important to understand you know, how to maximize efficiency and minimize cost for your project. There's also, you know, dozens and dozens of European glue lamp suppliers. Uh, two of the biggest that we see kind of, you know, competing in the North American market quite a bit are Binderholz and Hosslocker. You also have structural composite lumber products like PSL, LSL, LVL, or uh, eye joists. And then getting into panel products, these are generally what's available, NLT or DLT, CLT, uh, GLT, which is basically a glue lamp beam flipped on its side to make a wide, thin panel, and then structural composite lumber panels. Similarly, it's just composite products built into a big panel. Some of the suppliers for these, uh, DLT is StructureCraft in Abbotsford, and NLT is kind of a productized, manufactured NLT product in Ontario. However, NLT can be built by basically anyone with a garage and a bunch of nails. Um, it could be highly sophisticated or not very sophisticated. CLT, there's Nordic, Element 5, Kolesnikov, Mercer, and also many, many European suppliers. GLT, you got Western Artrib, but technically most of the glue lamp suppliers could make this. And then SCL or composite lumber, there's Frayers out of Oregon that make a mass plywood panel, which is quite similar to CLT. And then LSL panels made by Weyerhaeuser. And then you can look at taking these products and, and combining them into timber concrete composites. Um, and, and you might be wondering, you know, why use the composite action? And generally, it's just to take advantage of the strengths of each of the different materials. So concrete's high compressive strength with timbers, high tensile strength while being so lightweight. And generally, you're going to have concrete anyway for acoustics or fire protection. So by increasing the concrete and adding some connectivity between it and the timber, you can achieve things that you know standard timber panels alone cannot achieve achieve and we'll talk about that a little later.
Uh, here's sorry, I'll go back. Just a photo of you know how these connections take place. It can be screws sticking out. It can be plates. It can be as simple as just notches in the panel. Uh, here's a photo from a project we did in Portugal with the Cree system, which consists of kind of precast concrete panels on glue lamb ribs. You also have specialty products um, or other types of hybrid construction with steel and timber. This is a neat one from Pico that was originally developed for precast concrete called a Delta Beam. Uh, that you can use in combination with glue lamp columns and mass timber decking to create like a, a flush beam uh, look. So now we'll talk a bit about, you know, arranging these products and how you use them to resist gravity loads. So heavy timber is, you know, an old school construction type that's been around for quite some time. This is a photo of our office in downtown Toronto. Uh, it's a 1914 building that's basically built with NLT and large sawn timber beams and columns. You know, there's buildings like this all over Ontario and especially Toronto. And interestingly, a lot of them would not be allowed by today's current code, but you know, the proof is in the pudding to have the longevity that other construction types of this era do. So basically what we're trying to do with mass timber is bring back this construction type, but using kind of more sophisticated products. And now we'll talk about the massing and layout principles. So generally the span ranges are, the efficient span ranges between five meters and up to 12 but 12 is kind of pushing the limits. With just solid wood panels like NLT or CLT, you're talking about you know three to six meters or 10 to 20 feet. With composites, you could push that up to six to nine meters. And then with fancier composite systems like T-slabs and stress skin panels, um, you could go all the way up to 40 feet. So this is just a sketch from an SD phase of a product project. And, you know, because of all the different products and options and systems, we tend to do a lot of, I, I call it optioneering to kind of settle on what's the ideal system, what suits, you know, the products that are available to you um, in the time and schedule and cost that you need and, and what suits the architectural intent the best. Generally, you can arrange these in two broad systems, point supported or flat plate construction on the left or post and beam construction on the right. So point supported is exactly what it sounds like. You have a large CLT panel that's supported on its corners and edges by just columns. So this is a beamless solution. And this system is really best suited for residential uh, where you have, a, where you can have a tight column grid and the grid range is, you know, between three and four meters up to three and a half by four meters. Um, and really you want to try to get to a five ply. So you're really in these three to four and three and a half to 3.6 meter ranges um, because that's going to be the biggest driver of your cost. Some of the pros of this system are fast installation, simple and very repetitive details, as well as MEP distribution. The cons are flexibility in organizing your spaces. You, you're gonna have a tight array of columns. Um, it could be quite sensitive to fabrication limitations, which we'll talk about. And you're limited to panel products that have two-way bending. So that would be CLT and MPP. Post and beam can really be applied to any construction type and the efficiency range is kind of like a six by six or up to a nine by nine meter grid or a combination like a six by nine. Um, and again, you really want to try to minimize your panel thickness as much as possible. So like a three ply CLT or a two by six NLT, because it's just going to be the biggest driver of the cost if you have a large surface area. Uh, the pros are 
flexibility in the arrangement of the spaces. You can, you know, change column positions and technically do transfers if you'd like. Um, and it's generally a lower overall volume of timber. The cons are the floor to floor height, as well as kind of MEP considerations, like routing your distribution. Here are just some examples of how you could arrange a post and beam system. It could just be, you know, a one way simple span panel between beams that connect the columns. You could use a timber concrete composite and kind of push that grid spacing and span a little farther. Or you could add secondary beams or purlins, um, which will allow you to just have a bigger bay and larger column spacings at the expense of more beams. So in summary, you know, CLT and MPP can be used in either of these point supported and post and beam, whereas GLT and NLT are really limited only to post and beam because they don't have that two-way bending. And the post and beams can basically be any of the linear products, but will depend a bit on the co-considerations and minimum dimensions you need for your fire. So like I mentioned, the fabrication and supply limitations will have an impact on your design. For point supported, you're, you're really at the mercy of what panel dimensions are actually available because that is gonna dictate your grid spacing. Um, and you really wanna maximize the panel dimensions for increased installation efficiency, but also minimize waste. So you can see the text might be a little small, but um, this is a list of suppliers and what panel dimensions they do make and their maximum widths. So in one direction, your grid is gonna be based on the panel width and the other direction, you want it to be a multiple of what their maximum length is. Um, and as you can see, kind of the bigger the go you go, the less suppliers are able to produce it. So you wanna either settle on one early or, you know, make your design as agnostic as possible to get competitive bids. Post and beam is, like I said, less sensitive to these fabrication limits. Um, but what applies to both is the shipping limitations. Um, and this is especially important if you're considering European supply, because there's very different shipping costs versus shipping in containers or more costly methods like break bulk or open top shipping. Um, again, comparing the systems, one thing is is the overall building height. Um, for a flat slab, you can generally have shorter floor-to-floor -floor heights because you don't have to contend with beams. And this is obviously, most importantly, reduces just your facade costs or your enclosure costs, um, but also can increase your energy efficiency because you just have less area, you know, less external area for heat transfer. Again, comparing the two, uh, the flat plate gives you a lot of flexibility in MEP distribution because you don't have to contend with those pesky beams. Um, whereas the point there, sorry, the post and beam, you need to come up with a strategy that works in conjunction with the beams, either you know missing them or passing through them very strategically. So I'll talk briefly about lateral systems. Um, there are some wood-based lateral systems that are approved in code. Uh, so lightwood frame walls, which could be used like one to six stories, timber brace frames, again, similar range, and CLT shear walls. Um, I've got the stories listed up to eight there, but up to taller buildings, the connections can become quite unruly. Um, and it's something that because it can often be a delegated design item to design the connections, you don't actually realize how unruly and sometimes ugly these connections can be. So it's something to consider when you're, uh, you know, when you're trying to select a system. You can also use conventional systems like concrete cores and shear walls um, in conjunction with the mass timber superstructure or steel brace frames. Uh, if you're using steel brace frames, one of the important considerations is the fire protection. Um, and that's something we see get get missed. 
So now we'll get into the code considerations. So obviously here in Ontario, we've got the national building code, which feeds into the Ontario building code, uh, both of which reference the Canadian wood code or CSA 086 for the design. And then you also have city requirements. I've also shown the IBC, the American model code here, um, and I'll get into why that is important. Generally under six stories, uh, fully exposed mass timber is permitted depending on your occupancy. Uh, and you'll be required to design the members for a fire resistance rating. Um, and for residential, this is typically one hour and for assembly occupancies can be two. Above this limit and up to 12 stories, the encapsulated mass timber construction type is permitted, which is a new construction type introduced in NBC 2020, which has been early adopted by many provinces, including Ontario. And this allows for taller mass timber buildings that are encapsulated in drywall. Um, the Canadian Wood Council and Woodworks have released this comprehensive guide that's here, that's available for free online. Um, that kind of goes into detail on all of the considerations. So I would, uh, you know, encourage you all to go take a look at that. Some of the important things are the encapsulation requirements. So for floors, concrete on top and gypsum on the bottom for beams and columns, you know, multiple layers of drywall um, protecting them from fire. And even with this protection, uh, you still have minimum member dimensions that you need for it to be considered EMTC. So make sure you are aware of what those minimum dimensions are. So due to the, you know, the novel nature of mass timber, these codes are constantly evolving. And there's a new joint committee between BC and Quebec that's aiming to harmonize the building codes between the provinces. Um, Ontario and Alberta have since joined. And their first order of business is to allow for EMTC buildings up to 18 stories as early as this spring. And this is essentially early adopting the NBC 2025 proposed changes that follow in the footsteps of the IBC 2021. And then next, they wanna incorporate and early adopt the IBC 2024 building types, which allow for fully exposed buildings up to 18 stories. Uh, which is expected in the NBC 2030. And if this sounds confusing, it's because it is. <laughs> you have, you know, early adopting multiple codes from multiple jurisdictions that are several cycles ahead of where we are. So really encourage, you know, you to get a good con code consultant who's knowledgeable and can also, you know, navigate this with the AHJs who are frankly, can be struggling to keep up with all of these changes. And, you know, back to the IEC 2021, these are the building types that are currently allowed by states that have um, adopted it. So it's already kind of permits more building types than are currently allowed in Canada. So you can go nine stories fully exposed and up to 18 stories encapsulated. The EMTC provisions also have construction requirements. So they require temporary fire protection throughout the construction. So no more than four contiguous stories can be unprotected during construction. So you basically need to encapsulate as you go uh, with at least one layer of protection. And this can be a major sequencing issue that's overlooked um, because you, you can't really encapsulate without enclosing the envelope. Um, so it's really important to discuss this early with your contractors and erectors to determine the best way to tackle this to avoid delays on site. Uh, some of the things to consider are the temporary water protection of those encapsulated elements. So you might have like a temporary roof at one level. Um, alternative materials for encapsulation uh, that have drying potential, like dense glass, rock wool, or firmicell. And kind of how to use this to your advantage to stack trades so they can work in parallel. In addition to this, some AHJs and insurance providers will also require temporary standpipes uh, for protection during construction, which would not be required in non-combustible construction. So now we'll talk about kind of other design considerations and 
there's a lot to get into. So we can't really get into all of them in great detail, but just kind of, you know, give you things to look out for and things that you should be planning for. Really what drives all this is the production lead time. And this is kind of the learning curve for mass timber construction. Um, I'll say it three times, lead time, lead time, lead time. Um, due to the, the highly pre-planned and prefabricated approach, the lead times are just longer than conventional construction. And, you know, currently suppliers are saying about 12 to 16 weeks, and that's going to depend on all sorts of things. You know, what's their current workload, where the project is, how big it is. And it's very important to realize that this is after the shop drawings are approved, not when they get their contract and not when you've issued your IOC drawings, but after the shop drawings have been approved. So this really pulls forward the need to coordinate items that are you typically deferred until later in the construction process. Um, one of the biggest ones is MEP. And we see it all the time where it'll drive late changes and cause big schedule delays. Basically compared to conventional construction types, mass timber can be less flexible with MEP distribution. And the consultants and contractors are also less experienced. So to avoid changes and schedule delays, it's really imperative to do this coordination up front. Um, and you need to ensure your approach to distribution works in conjunction with your structural system. Penetration th through beams are possible, but are limited in size and location and must be planned in advance. You also need to consider, you know, the support of heavy rooftop equipment and BMUs. Roof anchors. Roof anchors are, you know, not a very exciting part of a building design that usually gets coordinated quite late and, you know, oftentimes during construction. And we take it for granted that, you know, many suppliers have typical details that can basically be deployed to conventional building types that can't be used the same way in mass timber construction. And the supporting structure needs to be designed for the loads imparted by the roof anchors, which are, which can be pretty big. Um, so this may require unforeseen additional structure that can compromise the architecture while also, you know, adding cost and schedule. So really there's a theme here, you know, plan early and engage the subcontractors as soon as you can. Stairs, another big one. Uh, specialty or feature stairs are another item that are typically detailed after the primary structure. And you need to consider the loads from the stairs and provide a supporting structure, sometimes without knowing what the stairs are going to be. So this either introduces risk or you just have to grossly over-design things to accommodate a wide array of options. Um, and one of the important considerations here for feature stairs especially, is the vibration performance. So you might not be able to get that out of the stairs themselves, and you might need to increase the stiffness of the supporting structure to kind of make the performance acceptable. So having an idea of what that stair design is going to be early on to feed into the fabrication design is going to be really important. Elevators, leg roof anchors. A lot of suppliers are not experienced. They don't have typical details. They don't have an understanding of the behavior. And I've heard of some that just aren't interested at all in putting an elevator in a mass timber shaft. Um, but it's certainly possible and viable and is done all the time. So just getting ahead of that early, encouraging you know their input early on if they need help, et cetera. Coatings. Coatings is another one that's kind of not thought about until too late in the game. Um, coatings can be used to protect timber from moisture, UV damage, and even fire. Like there's a quirk in the code where you can, you know, design the exposed timber to have the required fire resistance rating, but it might not have the required flame spread rating. And there are coatings out there that can help. Uh, the typical supplier pricing will include one layer of end grain sealer on all elements and cut surfaces, but it is the responsibility of the architects and the engineers to specify additional coatings if they are required. These coatings could be quite costly just due to all the labor that's involved in applying them. 
So you really need to discuss it early with the supplier and see what options are because, you know, architectural finishes are usually not included in your price. Another thing is the temporary protection of exposed steel pieces, uh, which is usually connections. Uh, and, you know, the responsibility for specifying this is usually within the architect's scope. So we're going to talk a bit about that more in Micah's section. And then there's always some site finishing that needs to be done. So you want to discuss with your contractor to weigh the benefits of pre-finishing versus refinishing or, you know, applying those coatings on site. The next big one is facade. Um, you know, most suppliers not yet used to attaching to mass timber structures and it's not the same as concrete. So it requires careful planning for the supporting structure to support the facade, but also to prevent interference between the facade connections and, you know, parts of the primary structure. Um, and in order to design them, you need to establish the design criteria, like the deflection limits and interstory drift. And sometimes you don't know these things until you actually have the supplier and the system figured out. So again, you can over-design things or there's risk of changes later on if the limits are you know, not what you expected them to be. A very, very important thing here is that the attachments between the facade and the primary structure can be a scope gap where the facade supplier or the timber supplier don't account for it. Um, so you really need to make sure it's accounted for because we've seen some extremely costly uh, miscellaneous metal change orders uh, to accommodate these later on. So in summary, you know, if, if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail from old Benny Franklin. Um, the theme of this section is really just planning and pulling forward as much of the design as possible uh, so that you can realize the schedule savings presented by pre-manufactured mass timber production. Um, you just got to eliminate as many variables as possible. So if possible, get early supplier input on desired structural system and consult with the other trades. Develop your MVP routing early and make sure it's compatible with the framing. Co-consultants are your best friends. Um, and then bring in suppliers early for design assist roles uh, for typically you know, delegated items. You want to take all that and implement it in your fabrication design, which Thomas is going to talk about. And then also, in all of these steps, you want to consider the construction sequencing and constructability which Michael will get into in more detail. And if you do all that, then you profit from a successful mass timber project. Uh, so now I'll kick it over to Tom and he will talk about the fabrication design. That one's great. Thanks, Jamie. Um, so yeah, before or basically towards the end of your um, design phase, you want to start thinking about production and what needs to happen during that phase. Fabrication design is often also referred to as the, the shop drawing process and or in this case, uh, preparation for the production. Um, so if we have a closer look and what's the essentials here on um, on fabrication design, um, we're gonna first talk about the essentials um, to consider, then um, the importance of the collaboration during that phase. And third point will be the flow of information and materials, which is a, definitely a big one. And then at the end, last but not least, uh, reducing complexity, which um, can often be very beneficial. So um, what a typical process looks like for the fabrication design phase um, for a mass timber structure. Um, when we get involved or our team gets involved here for the fabrication design, we start with the design documents, in this case, um, for example, the IFC drawings, the structural drawings and the architectural drawings, and also um, the other relevant consultant packages. Um, we take that information, we study that, um, maybe also figure out the questions and the collaboration with the design team, and we start building a, a 3D model. And we do that usually in, in several steps, starting with the geometry, with the, the materials involved, and coordinate back and forth with the, with the entire team and also with the other trades. Um, as Jamie was pointing out, 
ideally MEP, for example, is uh, aligned with us on the timeline here and is to doing the same thing on their end. And we can uh, coordinate those 3D models at the same time. Then once we have that model in a good place and we have it approved, everyone is happy with it, uh, we can go into fabrication and we can send basically the data straight to the CNC machine from the 3D model, um, uh, which then basically CNC machine is going to cut all the uh, different connections and um, whatever you need on a panel or a beam. What also uh, happens uh, quite often in that stage is that connectors get pre-assembled in the shop, uh, pre-installed, so that we can then faster install on-site. And uh, of course, uh, on-site, there's the whole logistics side of things that we have the right part on-site at the right time, um, but also um, the drawing production so that the team on-site knows what to do and where to place which element and those drawings, they all come from the same 3D model so that we have a single source of truth. So those are really the, the steps we have. And now the, the importance of collaboration during that phase. Um, so basically, once we have the supplier engaged, um, we can really start building an accurate model. Um, so because we have uh, different sizing depending on a supplier, um, we have to make sure we know the supplier first before we actually start building an accurate model. Um, the other thing is scope delineation. It needs to be clear on who is supplying what and what they actually need from that model. And um, that's quite important to keep in mind. Um, then the other aspect of the collaboration here is that we uh, get also the production involved and have their feedback so that we don't actually model something that can't be produced. That's kind of the, the reason why we do the whole modeling to make sure that um, we have basically built the, the building in 3D space before it gets produced. And then of course, often also overlooked is the input from the installer. And um, they eventually have to put it all together on site and they know best how to do that. And um, so that can be very valuable to have that input as well. Um, we, Often also talk about schedule, I guess, <laughs> apart from the dollar, uh, that's usually the second most important thing. And the, what we often see here is that the MEP trade, for example, or the steel uh, supplier is getting involved later in the game. And if we want to really coordinate, they would have to be uh, in sync with the mass timber team to ensure that we can actually coordinate in 3D space. And then of course, um, there also needs to be a review from the design team, the ownership, and whoever else needs to have a, a look at those drawings. Um, we're not acting in a bubble here. Uh, it's really important that people have feedback so that they also know what to expect when the product arrives on site. So after um, we have coordinated with everyone, um, or well, actually also during that collaboration process, uh, it's very important to understand the flow of information, which we're going to see here on the next slide. Um, as I said at the beginning, typically we take the information coming from the design uh, design team, from the various consultants. And we also have um, <clears throat> to review and uh, check that information, if that's even feasible uh, with the chosen supplier, and if that can be implemented. Um, then of course the, the approval by all the stakeholders so that we can actually release into production and we don't have to uh, revert back at a later stage. Um, <clears throat> as we said a few times here, different suppliers have different geometry or different products available, product sizes. So that's very important to keep an eye on. And last but not least is uh, the sequencing so that we have the for example, that the connection can even be installed, it's important to uh, understand and how the building goes together. Um, <clears throat> then the other one is the flow of material. Uh, we're not talking about uh, a couple sticks. Uh, if the buildings get bigger, the volumes get bigger and it gets even more important that we have that under control. So here's a snapshot of a five-story office building, uh, which actually had 15 or 16 uh, phases um, of installation and also design in that case. 
So we have to make sure that we start designing on the phase one, uh, that also the installation is going to start on that phase one. <clears throat> um, the shipping process and constraints, as Jamie already mentioned, uh, Mike is going to go in a bit more detail there. Um, but then again, the whole shipping needs to be planned. It needs to be clear where every beam is going into which container. So it arrives at the right time on site. Um, then the next question is often a storage and buffer. Um, production maybe have a different speed than the installation. Um, so it uh, may have to be produced into storage before we can actually start installation. So we don't have to start and stop on site. And yeah, as we already mentioned previously, it's important to uh, coordinate and um, really think about the sequencing of the installation so that things don't have to be taken away again so we can fit something else. I guess that would be the worst case scenario to be avoided. But uh, luckily we have good tools um, that can help us these days with that for sure. So um, the last point really I want to touch on is the reducing complexity. And it's not the, the least important one. Um, what we often see is that um, connections um, might work on, on paper, but um, are overly complex and then therefore will also uh, cost a lot of money. Um, so there's various ways in how you can reduce complexity. So for example, um, if you have too many different products in a building, that is always a challenge. So if you can reduce the type of product used, that is a plus for sure. Um, the same applies to suppliers. If I have to talk to five different suppliers and coordinate with them, it is much more challenging than if I can talk to only one team on the other side. Um, connections, of course, uh, if we can keep it simple, it also usually tends to be cheaper. That is for sure. Um, it's not an easy task to reduce complexity, um, but it's definitely well invested time. Um, yeah, we come back to this uh, graph here. Um, so now we basically in the third um, vertical phase here, preparation for production. And as you can see, that's basically where the curves uh, overlap and the opportunity to influence and change the design is rapidly decreasing. Um, ideally, uh, a lot of it is clear when we start the, the fabrication design phase, um, but the reality is that it is a conversation, it's collaboration, and only towards the end of the fabrication phase, fabrication design phase, things are really clear and shouldn't be changed anymore, um, because we can also see here that the cost for changes will go up. Um, pretty much anything is possible in the world. You can change things at a very late in the game, but it always comes at a cost. And yeah, then things are starting to get real. We can see here a few snapshots from production um, where the glue lamb on the bottom left gets produced. And then uh, also more and more um, connectors get shop uh, installed because we have better quality control. We have um, better conditions for the workers in the, in the shop and is also more efficient than for the installation on site. And for that prefabrication, someone needs to make a drawing so that the the team on the shop floor needs uh, knows what's going on. And uh, that's also not an insignificant work to prepare all these drawings. And now uh, I kick it over to Maike, since uh, we have arrived on site. Thanks, Thomas. Um, so yeah, next we'll talk about some construction and installation challenges that we've seen on site and some of the uh, solutions that we've come up with. Um, so these are some of the key considerations we'll be discussing. So I'll talk about um, transportation of elements like Thomas and Jamie alluded to earlier, um, rigging considerations, temporary stability of your structural elements during installation, uh, challenges we faced with cambers, um, as well as moisture management on site and site logistics. So to begin uh, talking about the transportation of mass timber elements, it's really important to think about this during your early design stages. You need to think about um, some of these questions that I've listed here. So where are my materials coming from? Where are they going? How are they getting there? 
Are they being transported by trains or ships or trucks? Uh, will my loads be oversized? This can add an extreme amount of cost to your, or a significant amount of cost to your project. So you really need to think about this early in your design stage. Um, also, do I need to consider any unique geometry conditions? Um, are you transporting panels versus volumetric um, modules, those kinds of things? And also moisture management. Um, in terms of moisture management, um, typically for transportation, your materials will come um, wrapped, as you can see in this um, photo on the screen. Um, and this is an important thing to note in your specifications um, that moisture management needs to be considered during um, transportation. Um, also, this part will typically get uh, coordinated with the fabricator um, where they'll be doing trucking load plans and things and they will consider any unique weight limits along the um, transportation route. So are there any bridges along the route with um, certain loading requirements um, or do you need any special permits? And again, this can become expensive. Um, so next up, I'll talk a bit about uh, rigging of mass timber elements. Um, and this is incredibly important to think about with prefabricated um, constructions such as mass timber elements. Um, and it's certainly not to be overlooked um, as it can cause um, significant additional fees to your um, client. Um, so I'll begin with glue lamb column rigging as this can generally become unique on projects because it really depends on the geometry of your members. Um, when column rigging is forgotten about during the design phase, um, you we need to become creative. Um, so these are some of the examples that um, we've done in the past uh, when it's been thought about too late. So. Some examples are on the left there where we had to add stop blocks that are screwed in to the sides of our um, columns. And the challenge is that these columns are visually exposed. And so the penetrations from the screw holes need to be um, finished and patched on site. And then on the right hand side, we were using three rods uh, through our columns. Um, and again, these holes needed to be patched on site. Um, Additionally, uh, these screws, generally the suppliers only uh, rate their screws for single use. Um, so this can create um, a ton of waste on your project since you can only use them one time and therefore um, additional embodied carbon on your project. Uh, so I've talked a bit about um, patching of columns due to uh, things like rigging. Um, and it's not something you need to be afraid of. This is a project um, here in Vancouver. And um, all of the connections are concealed here. So you can see that they've patched it really beautifully. You can't even really tell that it's been patched. Um, so if you have skilled installers and uh, workers on site, you don't need to be afraid of it. Um, but uh, you do need to be aware of it because there are additional finishing costs to your project. Um, now, when column rigging is thought about early, um, you can often avoid these finishing and patching requirements. Um, so these are some of the project or some examples uh, where we've thought about it early. Uh, so on the left hand side, you can see a photo of um, a column that we were rigging that was actually 60 feet tall. So it was absolutely massive. And we were able to sling this column from underneath some beam hangers that were pre-installed on the um, beams or on the column. And this was really efficient uh, because it didn't require any patching or finishing on site. Uh, the other example in the middle there is kind of a U-shaped um, uh, column uh, where the beam um, sat within that uh, U. And we were able to install a, a rigging hardware in there um, that was screwed into the side and then we hoisted directly from there. And then the other, uh, the bottom photo and the one on the right are both the same project where we considered the column rigging in the permanent connection design, which is really advantageous. All we had to do was increase the, the length of the screws slightly. Um, and we were 
therefore able to break directly from that. Uh, so it, minor modifications to permanent connection hardware can be really, really uh, beneficial um, to satisfy your temporary stability or temporary rigging requirements. I'll, so next I'll talk about beams and uh, panel rigging. Generally, these are more standardized approaches to rigging uh, rather than with the columns where we need to become creative and unique. Uh, so for beams, generally we can just sling them. Um, so no, again, no finishing is required. It's really simple. And with um, CLT panels, uh, generally we can use mechanically fastened hardware, like you can see in the bottom right there from MTC Solutions, but there's tons of other suppliers that uh, have rigging hardware like this. There's also friction and clamping type anchors where in the um, factory, they can pre-drill these holes into the top of the CLT, and then you add this clamping hardware directly in it that expands and you can lift from there. Uh, you just have to be careful with protecting those types of holes during uh, uh, storage uh, because they can't be wet when you're rigging from them. So uh, now about temporary stability. So this is very similar to um, tilt up concrete construction or a steel construction where during installation, you need to consider their temporary stability before they're uh, fastened to your permanent lateral system. So again, this is something that shouldn't be overlooked um, early in the design. And um, it should be, your client should be notified that this um, can, become an additional scope that they need to budget for. So generally for temporary stability, we can use pretty simple hardware uh, like slings and um, tilt up braces, but uh, it can become more difficult on um, the next slide there when we have a, a concrete um, diaphragm doing the structural work for the permanent lateral system. So this is an example of a project um, for a massive tech company down at, near San Francisco. Um, and this project is in one of the most seismically active regions of the world. And so because of the seismicity of the region and also the geometry of this building, the uh, design team had chosen to use a concrete diaphragm. Um, which works really well for the permanent system, but it created challenges for us during installation as there was no um, real stability and we weren't tying to the permanent lateral system during installation. So all of these red plates that you can see in these photos were additional hardware that we had to add to create a temporary um, diaphragm and to connect to the uh, lateral system during construction. So you can see these plates are absolutely everywhere and they created a massive additional cost for the client that they had not anticipated at the beginning of their project. Um, and again, this can be avoided even with a, um, when you have a concrete diaphragm doing the lateral work. Um, if you think about it during your design and you create some sort of connections to your timber um, that can provide temporary stability the loads you're designing for for this stage are not nearly as high as the seismic loads. Um, so you typically can account for this quite easily in your um, design. Again, in this project, it created um, scheduling impacts um, as they had to do a lot more work before they could move up the height of the building. Um, some other challenges we faced are cambers. So cambers, are a great solution in some cases. You can camber up your members so that you can limit deflections in the permanent case as load is applied to them. Uh, but they can be really difficult to execute on site for the team. So this was a project where we had to camber up um, some glue lamp beams. So you can see the shoring towers there that were cranking up the center of the beams. Uh, so the other challenge on this project was, again, it was a timber concrete composite project, and these shoring towers needed to stay in place until the concrete was poured on top of the deck. So you can see down below this created challenges because the shoring towers remained in place as they poured concrete on that level. And so they had these blockouts around each of the shoring towers, which there were quite a lot of them. 
Um, on this project, it wasn't the biggest deal because they could come back, the concrete finishers could come back later uh, and pour that concrete, but it could become something to consider if you had, say, a polished concrete um, finish um, and you wouldn't want to uh, do this later. So now a bit about um, timber and how it um, is affected by moisture. So uh, timber is made up of grains uh, that are very similar to straws. We like to compare them to straws as it's a really simple analogy. So parallel to the straws, um, we have increased strength than in the or perpendicular direction, but it's also much more susceptible to moisture in that um, straw orientation. Um, so you really need to be careful with protecting the end grain of your uh, timber as it really wants to just suck up all that moisture. Now, this is more prevalent with linear products that like what Jamie was describing earlier. So blue lamb or sawn uh, timber, but with CLT where you have um, different orientations of panels uh, or of laminations is less susceptible to this, um, but you still need to think about it. Um, so in terms of dimensional stability, timber is a natural material, obviously, and it behaves differently to um, shrinkage, in its diff shrinkage in its different orientations. So parallel to grain, again, along that straw orientation, it doesn't change in dimension significantly, but perpendicular to its grain, it can expand and contract, um, so shrink and um, swell depending on how much moisture um, you see. So a general rule of thumb um, in the perpendicular to grain direction is for every 1% decrease in moisture content, you'll see a 0.25% decrease in dimension perpendicularly. So it doesn't seem like a, a lot. For example, here, it's typically standard to get your timber on site at around 14 to 15% moisture content. But over time, as your timber dries out, um, it can go down to about 8% moisture content. That's just a general rule of thumb. Now for a 40 inch deep beam on one story, you could, it could shrink down to 39.4 inches, which isn't a huge difference, but when you start to accumulate this over multiple levels, this can become more of an impact as it cumulatively adds. So how can you um, protect your timber um, from this moisture? So generally your contractor, well, your contractor needs to have a moisture management plan. And this is something that's really important for you to specify. And it should be uh, sent to you for general review. So for horizontal um, members like panels, like CLT panels, DLT, NLT, or GLT, um, self-adhering membranes are a really good practice. Um, so here you can see some photos of a self-adhering membrane that was um, installed on top of CLT decks. Now you want this um, membrane to be breathable to let water out, but you also want it to be resistant enough to not let moisture in. in. Um, you also want it to guard against UV damage and wood and, uh, or mold and wood discoloration. And for the site uh, workers, you want it to be durable, abrasion resistant and anti-slip. Um, in terms of installation, these membranes can be installed either on site or some factories are able to do this in the shop as well. Um, this really comes down to the installer's preference um, and costs and fabricator capabilities. In terms of protecting beams and columns, um, you, can in, you can install coatings and there's different types of coatings. So there's preventative um, versus finished coatings. Preventative is uh, standard practice and by fabricators. So they would typically add at least a coating on the end grain to protect that from its moisture susceptibility. Um, but if you have finished coatings, uh, you need to be really careful on site um, because um, it can create an immense amount of work on site again to uh, keep things nice and beautiful. 
um, so you don't have to, or so that you don't damage them. Um, and sometimes, uh, like I was explaining early during, earlier during the transportation slide, um, typically these members do come wrapped or at least bundles of them come wrapped. Um, and some installers like to keep the column wrap on the columns, but there's some um, pros and cons to leaving it on. Um, so it's really up to the installer again, how they want to uh, protect these columns. So this is an example um, where MEP equipment was thought about a little bit too late in the game. So MEP coordination is really critical to think about early on during construction. So this was a project where they had through um, both connections that went through the CLT at thousands of locations. Um, on, you can see the photo from above where they had that self-adhering membrane on top of the CLT and they had to cut out little uh, sections of it to install these through rods. And through each of these locations, there's moisture that came through and you can see that from below uh, where at each of these anchors, there's staining occurring from the um, through bolts. So it's really a shame that this happened. It creates a lot of finishing work for the installation team um, and it can be easily avoided if thought about early enough. So a simple solution for this would have been say a wood screw connection from below rather than the through bolt. Now in terms of steel, we, we use steel um, hardware a lot in our permanent, in our uh, connections on site um, and as you may know, when steel gets wet, it can cause staining. So the architect's responsibility is to specify the finishing on the steel. And what we find is that the best practice is to hot dip galvanize your steel um, to keep things uh, from staining. Stainless steel is another good option uh, for, especially for permanently exposed uh, timber connections that are outside and subject to rain throughout its service life. Um, this can be costly, but definitely effective. Uh, powder coating can be an option, though it's not foolproof. Um, if the powder coating gets damaged, it can get, um, it can cause staining, which you can see in that photo there. So this is going back to that project I um, spoke about earlier um, down in near San Francisco. So on that project, as I mentioned, we had to add a ton of steel on top of the CLT deck. And this is how the contractor wrapped it, which they did a beautiful job wrapping everything to prevent it from staining the timber. So moisture monitoring can be a good option for your um, project. Essentially, the idea is that your timber should be dry enough before your finishes are, are installed so, so that you don't see all, all of that shrinkage occurring as much. Um, so again, 15% moisture content is completely normal during installation, but if you have more than that, it can become quite problematic. So in addition to good moisture management practice practices, uh, monitoring sensors um, are something that should be considered um, in your project. So something that's good to have, and it should be at least a minimum, is what you can see on the left there. This is just a simple moisture monitoring um, system that you can get at any Home Depot. Um, so they should be checking the um, moisture of the timber before they install their finishes. Um, a really great and better option is to have um, permanent um, sensors in your system, in your, especially for uh, flat roofs um, installed in your structure. This is becoming more and more common in Europe and we highly suggest it. Um, so these sensors can be installed on flat roofs or anywhere throughout your building um, and they can detect um, issues during the life of your project. Um, to detect things like leaks. So moving on from moisture, I'll talk a bit about site logistics and the importance of it. Um, 
mass timber has many inherent benefits um, in terms of uh, installation and efficiency. It can be incredibly fast to install on site and cut down your construction time if it's planned properly. This is a sample of a project where we planned the installation logistics for it and the sequencing. And we had hundreds of pages explaining the exact sequencing steps for each member. But this, was, this really helped the team on site plan all of their logistics. Uh, next slide, yeah. Okay, so this is uh, a sample of one of our sequencing plans. So this was just one of those pages uh, from earlier. Uh, this showed the CLT sequencing plan. So this plan shows each member's ID number from the fabricator, as well as when, um, at what, which step it should be uh, installed. So they were all numbered sequentially. So um, these uh, sequencing plans were really beneficial for both the fabricator as well as the installation team. Um, the fabricator was able to use these to plan their um, bundles to, um, for the material to arrive on site at the correct times and for the installation team to be able to know exactly where each element is and at what, which stage to install it. Um, yeah. So again, this helped the fabricator bundle their materials. And this is just a screenshot of the site. So all of the um, boxes that you can see there are all the bundles of material. And the installer was able to see exactly which elements were in which of these bundles um, and created a really uh, clean um, and efficient site. Uh, and this is what the site looked like. So really great moisture um, management there. They wrapped each of these bundles of materials um, during in the storage yard so that it wouldn't get wet or um, damaged. And it also, yeah, it was incredibly clean and everyone knew exactly what was where and what needed to be installed on site at what time. Um, and that maximized the efficiency. So that concludes our session. Uh, so some of the takeaways um, that we want you to keep in mind is that Front-loading the detailed design stage pays dividends on the success of your project. You should really um, push thing, all the collaboration forward and have knowledgeable stakeholders um, in your project at the right times uh, to make this go smoothly and efficiently um, so everybody profits. Um, fabrication design is incredibly important to consider as you're essentially building your building in a virtual space before ever bringing it to site. And this creates a really smooth um, installation and make sure, make sure that everything fits um, correctly. Um, you want to think about your fabrication and installation during your design stage to, again, maximize on, on efficiency and consider some challenges, some construction challenges that you might face uh, and think about those during your planning stages. So thanks a lot for your time. We really appreciate um, you joining us today. Again, my name is Micah. Um, Thomas is from our Swiss office and Jamie from Toronto. If you have any questions, please reach out to us. Um, we're happy to help you uh, with any questions you have. And yeah, we'll start answering some questions now. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. If I can just jump in for a second. This is just a reminder to our members, if you do have any questions, please post them into the Q&A window. Uh, our presenters are going through all those questions right now. Thank you. Okay, we'll start at the top. Um, so, um, yes, the PowerPoint presentation will be shared with participants. Um, Nicholas asked, I understand the lead time re regarding production and fabrication following shop drawings. However, can you please also touch on your recommendations for early procurement of the material itself, sourcing challenges and the cost benefit analysis of early delivery and storage costs, maintaining suitable storage conditions, etc. Tom, you might be best suited for that one. Yes. Um, so I guess that the storage is definitely something to consider. Um, so that you have more buffer and more flexibility, especially if products come from Europe or also from a plant further away from your site. 
Um, we've even seen across North America some delays due to trucking. Um, so that can occur for sure. Um, the challenge with the storage, of course, it has a cost to it. So I guess um, that really project specific, you would have to look look at it and probably talk to an installer or supplier directly to to really project specific find the right the right answer for. And I guess the suitable storage conditions, yeah, of course, the warehouse is always easier because you don't need to wrap everything, and but it comes at a cost, um, for sure. So we've seen both options either, uh, like the pictures Mike has shown, uh, being stored outside, but also warehouses being hired, just to uh, have to avoid the wrapping, and potentially also do some finishing, pre-finishing already before it gets installed. Yeah, and it's going to depend on the location of your site, you know, how much, you know, lay down area you might have, like storing it outside your site is not, you know, it, it can be suitable um, with proper planning. And obviously, you got to have the space. And um, maybe another important one is handling. If you have to handle your materials three, four, five times, uh, that's always risk for damage. So yeah, it's definitely a balance between flexibility, cost and damage. Uh, Okay, moving on. Uh, expand expand on the benefits of mass timber construction. Is it cheaper, more sustainable, or only when compared to concrete? I mean, generally, the the big driver of you know why we're seeing this shift in towards mass timber construction is sustainability and embodied carbon. Um, however, that's not the only benefit. I mean, I'm biased, but aesthetically, architecturally, it's a beautiful material, creates nice spaces, but also it it can be cheaper when you're considering the schedule. Um, if it's planned properly and um, executed correctly, it, it can be much, much faster than conventional construction types, um, you know, which allows for, you know, you're carrying risk insurance for less time, you're operating your building sooner and, you know, gaining the revenues associated with that. Um, and that's really kind of, the big thing that that makes it competitive right now. Um, looking forward, lots of jurisdictions are actually implementing embodied carbon requirements, um, which is going to you know further advance the need to to look at solutions that have lower embodied carbon, and which you know timber construction is is an obvious choice there. And maybe add, to add to that, there's also, it doesn't always need to be only mass timber. Uh, there's also a good option of hybrid structures, or even if you have a concrete steel or steel frame and you have a timber facade, that's still a, a good option too. Yeah, so I mean, this kind of segues into the next question from Randy uh, about a cost benefit analysis from all phases, you know, embodied carbon versus life cycle carbon contribution. Uh, and how are these balanced considering priority for each as a final decision maker? I mean, this is going to depend highly on your client and their motivations. Like I said, these embodied carbon requirements are, are usually owner driven right now. Um, especially if that owner is, you know, a public entity. Um, and, and there are tools, like you said, life cycle analysis that we can use to, to compare, you know, the mass timber construction to other construction types um, and, and use those to, you know, help make a decision between systems. Um, how, uh, yeah, go ahead, Tom. Maybe to add here on, um, I've just heard on a, uh, a convention yesterday that also different um, financing might be available if you meet certain certain targets on the embodied carbon that you couldn't otherwise access. So there's definitely considerations on that end as well. Yeah. Um, next, the next question. One, yeah, go ahead, Tom. Uh, no, you got. <laughs> um, I think we've seen some shafts definitely um, in, in timber. Um, I think the ones I've seen were up to four or five stories. Um, of course, if you go taller, you may have to encapsulate um, the timber, um, but that's still possible. You can do that prefabricated and pre lined already when it comes to site. Um, in terms of regulation, I would have to kick it to you, Jamie. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, high is a relative term when you're talking about mass tumor buildings. Like, you know, we're only limited to 12 right now and, and soon 18. And even in those those taller 12-story buildings, we're, we're typically not seeing timber shafts. But you know, we have projects right now, eight stories in Toronto that have CLT elevator shafts. So they're they're being built. And I think there's likely some in the U.S. that are taller. Um and it, it really depends on your location and your lateral demands. Um, you could also use it as a shaft without using it as the lateral system. There's there's options there. Moving on to Shannon's question. Have you seen prefab facade systems which are installed quickly used as an effective moisture management system? Our team is considering this to avoid the cost of membranes, but I'm sure if this completely replaces the need for coatings. So yeah, I mean, prefab facade systems do exist. And I, I assume you're saying that it's going to be kind of installed in parallel with your superstructure to reduce the need for additional coatings for moisture protection. That's certainly a good idea. Um, as Mike had mentioned about with their straw analogy, you you typically always want end grain sealer. Um, so you'll never replace the need for that coating just to protect mostly during you know, even the short time it is being erected, but also during transportation. Um, yeah, I mean, I, as far as products uh, for prefab facade systems, I think there's lots of people out there right now trying it. And Tom, I'm sure you are have seen some in Europe, um, but we're definitely seeing that more and more. Yes, I think a good example in North America is probably Brock Commons in Vancouver, where the facade was installed in parallel. Mm -hmm. Just in addition to installing facade systems during the erection of your um, superstructure, we have, um, like in terms of temporary stability for, for your structure, we've come across challenges with this, and not that they can't be faced, and, and it depends completely on your um, system, but you might need to wait until a certain stage in your um, construction sequence before installing your facade because you do want to tie to your lateral system um, ideally before you install the facades because it can um, induce additional wind loading on your structure um, just from the temporary case. Okay, next one, a uh, multi-parter. Um, so heavy timber construction, is it costlier in bigger buildings? I mean, it, it's hard to make a blank, blanket statement. We, it, it depends on all sorts of things. It depends on the embodied carbon requirements of the owner. It depends on the schedule. Um, there's all sorts of things other than just the cost of raw material that, that need to be considered. The maintenance requirements are maybe marginally higher than other buildings, but I, I don't think it's significant. More time consuming um, in the design, maybe in the construction, certainly less so. And the life cycle is, is the, really the same as any other conventional building type out there. Um, no, I hope that answered those. Uh, next question, do designers plan hoist holes in columns for bracing or does it usually get done by the fab phase? So yeah, this is one of the things that we're talking about is it does usually get done actually even after the fabrication design phase um, because the contractor and their erection engineers aren't necessarily on board yet. So again, continuing the theme, like if you can get those people involved earlier, they can provide that input and you can plan for it and you know incorporate the the rigging requirements into the temporary into the the permanent connection details um which Micah showed an example of so yes typically it's done even after the fabrication design phase ideally it's done during the fabrication design phase or yeah or even earlier yeah if you can plan it into permanent connections. Sometimes you just need to upgrade your permanent connections slightly. For example, increase screw length slightly um, so that you can um, hoist directly from those connections. And that can 
I mean, it increases that connection's hardware, but it can uh, reduce less or it create less uh, waste in the final case because, um, for example, what I mentioned earlier, like um, those screws can only get rated for a single hoist. So it can create a lot of additional wasted screws, in some case, thousands of screws on a project that just get thrown out. So, and additional labor. And I mean, sometimes, sometimes you can get it for free. Um, if you just check whatever connection you have and you see if it's suitable for the rigging, then you can just use it for the rigging and, you know, no extra cost. That's the, the best case. Mm -hmm. uh, question from Randy. Great presentation. Thank you. Um, any post-construction analytics on CBA, carbon, IPD, it would be a great, uh, for a segmenter for the oh great segment for the presentation yeah i mean that's something we have presented on uh and we kind of we have a kind of internal director of sustainability i mean i'll happily put you in touch with her uh to and she could follow up with you on that but she's kind of in charge of basically ha having an internal database of the embodied carbon in our projects and comparing those to you know what the industry averages are or what's being planned. Um, should I take on the next one from Angela? Sure, yeah. Um, who is uh, sequencing uh, the installation or, um, <clears throat> so it's typically the installer themselves um, would be ideal if they have their say because they have their preferences and experiences. And basically we would then work together with them during the fabrication design phase to test it. Um, in a 3D model, it's relatively easy to assign sequence attributes and you can do all sorts of fancy things with um, um, videos and sequence drawings. Um, that all depends a bit on um, what's needed and uh, what makes sense. I mean, typically, if you just have a post and beam building, uh, it's relatively straightforward. You just need to know in which corner you want to start. Um, it gets a bit more critical if you have stairs, for example. Um, or some more uh, complex geometries, then you want to have a closer look for sure. Yeah, it's really important to have the installation team um, kind of develop this sequence in uh, by collaborating with the fabricator and an installation engineer um, if required. Um, and because it's really dependent on your site logistics, how much space do you have on your site and uh, where can you place cranes? How far do they need to reach? Those kinds of things need to be dictated by the installation team. Yeah, and, and further to your question about testing, like some of the larger projects we've worked on, they'll do mock-ups of, you know, a, a small section of the building to kind of test the connectors that they're using, test how the facade attaches. So that's something we've seen a few times on, on bigger projects. Next question from Richard. Do you have any recommendations for early coordination and engagement with a supplier when competitive tender under stip sum contract is required, i.e. by public procurement policies? Yeah, that's a, a sticky situation to try to get the suppliers involved uh, when you have a competitive tender. But there's, you know, third party consultants out there. I mean, I'll plug us who can help you navigate kind of what what strategies are available to you. Um, and there's other other people who can help you out with that as well. And also just, yeah, you can talk to multiple fabricators during that process and get their feedback. They're, they're usually always eager to provide design assist for free. Um, and you just, you can make that process competitive as well. You don't have to pick one horse and, and go with it. Um, you just got to see what's out there and and kind of make your design compatible with with multiple suppliers. Uh, next question from Gabriel: Is there a minimum scale to a project at which it becomes economically viable to use mass timber construction? Um, not necessarily. I mean, we've seen it on small houses to you know large office buildings. I think it 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 depends. Um, yeah, go ahead, project, also the visual uh, appearance and that kind of uh, the feel 
of the of the material becomes more important. But yeah, as Jamie said, we've seen it across the entire range almost. Uh, do insurers consider mass timber as a greater risk than steel or concrete? I mean, anecdotally, I hear yes. I mean, we don't deal with them as much. We kind of hear what the general contractors are saying. Um, but yeah, I mean, some instances they do, um, and it will affect your builder's risk insurance, but it's going to, uh, yeah, it's going to depend on the supplier on the market. I mean, insurance companies consider everything. Um, but I mean, as it becomes more and more prevalent, I think that risk will come down and thus the cost of the insurance as well. And maybe on that side of things as well, it's uh, also a conversation with the insurers and it's usually good to have that conversation early on. So it's um, once they understand the risk that's present, they uh, are also more willing to deal with it from what we've heard uh, in the industry. Great. Right on time. Impressive. Yes, that's great, Jamie, uh, Thomas, and Michael. Thank you very much for the great uh, presentation. And thank you all very much for a great webinar today. Um, as we conclude this webinar, I would like to draw your attention to several important announcements. Our next webinar is scheduled for next week, February the 22nd, also at 11 a.m. And the title, Condos, Architect, Architects, and Terrions New Home Warranty. The OAA will report your participation in this webinar to your transcript. Therefore, there is no need for individual reporting on your part. We kindly ask for your patience as we process and confirm the accreditation of the hours within the next few weeks. Additionally, all attendees will soon receive the presentation file via email along with a link to pro provide your feedback, which we highly value. Once again, thank you very much for your attendance and have a productive and pleasant remainder of your day. Thomas, Jamie, and Michael also, thanks again to you. Yeah, thank you for inviting us and thanks everyone for listening and for your great questions. Have a great day. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.